Christine, to Taylor Shield with Dr. Guy Burdick. For those of you who don't know Fertility New Zealand, uh, we have been in existence for around 25 years and we provide information mainly through our website, fertilitynz.org.nz, and support um, through a fantastic network of volunteers around the country and advocacy where we represent New Zealanders based within fertility. So without um, further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Goodick. Um, you'll see that there is a chat box on the screen, so during the presentation, feel free to um, to type your questions in, and Dr. Goodex will um, answer them either during the during the talk or at the end. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Nicola, and good evening, everyone, to the first um, of these webinar presentations in the um, Fertility Awareness Week. Um, as Nicola explained, I'm a fertility specialist and I've been working in the area of um, infertility since the early 1990s in New Zealand. What I'm going to do is run through a few slides that just summarise some of the issues um, to do with understanding fertility. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions at the end and I will expand on each of the slides just with what I think are some um, pertinent points. In terms of what is infertility, um, it's probably important to make the distinction between subfertility and infertility. So a lot of couples are not actually infertile, which means the complete inability to get pregnant. A lot of couples are subfertile, meaning it's going to take them longer than normal. And when I went through medical school 30 years ago, um, the length of time that you find infertility was in fact two years, um, 24 months. And the World Health Organization about 20 years ago reduced that to 12 months. Um, and as I'll point out in the later slide, in fact if age is an issue, say if a woman's over 35, or if you know about a pre-existing medical condition, um, then it's reasonable to seek advice after only six to nine months. So as an example, if a woman knows that she has polycystic ovary, she's been previously diagnosed with that, she stops the pill and has had no periods after five or six months, it's completely reasonable to seek medical advice then rather than waiting the whole 12 months. Similarly, if a young man's had um, a twisted testicle or an undescended testicle when he was younger, um, it would be very reasonable to seek advice earlier um, and certainly as a first step get a semen analysis done without waiting the year. There are many contributors to infertility. Uh, we'll put some of them up there including sperm issues, um, fallopian tube issues, endometriosis. It's really important to remember that half of the time um, there is a male factor half of the time there is a female factor. And not infrequently we find that couples have a fairly mild sperm problem, fairly mild female problem, and that can combine to a, a, a moderate issue. We do investigate couples fully, and a sperm test is one of the very first tests that we do, because we don't want to focus on, on, on an ovulation problem, and in fact also miss the fact that there's a sperm problem. One of the other really important issues, and I'll, I'll touch on it towards the end, is obviously the issue of age, particularly related to um, the female age. In the 1970s in New Zealand, it was quite common to get married in your early 20s and to start having children by your mid-20s. Whereas now, as you're probably aware, the average age for your first baby is right up to 30 at least. And increasingly, people are waiting until they're 35. And we know that fertility for some women can be quite compromised by the time they're 35. So age is certainly an important issue that we're dealing with now. Who does infertility affect? Well, it equally affects men and women. And probably close to a third of um, couples will at some stage have difficulty conceiving. And it's really important also to remember that there can be secondary infertility, meaning that they've had no difficulties getting pregnant with their first baby and now they're desperately wanting a second baby and, and experiencing problems. It could be a new sperm problem, it could be a tube problem, and again, relating back to age, not infrequently a woman will have got pregnant easily in her early 30s and then comes to see us at 35 or 36 because she's having trouble. 
And when we test it, we find that her ovarian reserve or her egg numbers um, have quite significantly declined just in those two or three years. And that can also make a difference. I think there was a Herald article a few months ago suggesting that if a young woman's planning uh, to have maybe three children, it's sensible to start, in fact, by your, by your mid-twenties um, to give you a very good chance of having enough time for that. In terms of some of the treatment options for infertility, once a couple have been fully investigated, we'll start off by giving any lifestyle advice, um, such as gaining or losing weight, stopping smoking, and any other modifiable life factor issues. The treatments that we employ include um, giving medication, usually tablets, if ovulation is a problem. So if a woman's having regular predictable periods, she's likely to be ovulating. But we check that with a blood test in the second half of the cycle. And the commonest cause of an ovulation problem would be polycystic ovary, which, as you're probably aware, can affect up to about 20% of young women. And the good news is that it's quite simply treated, usually, by taking a tablet called letrozole. We use that in preference to the more old-fashioned drug clomiphene because it has a better chance of success and there's a lower chance of twin pregnancy with letrozole. It's also very simple to take and, and requires less monitoring. We do sometimes also use a tablet called metformin, which is a, a, a tablet more commonly used for diabetes. But if you have polycystic ovary and you need to have ovulation induced, it can be helpful to take metformin as well. <clears throat> we do do fallopian tube surgery. The metriosis is an issue. And intrauterine insemination remains a popular treatment in New Zealand because it's relatively affordable compared to IVF, much simpler to do, and if the sperm is of good quality and the woman particularly is under the age of 40, it can cumulatively over three or four cycles have a pretty reasonable chance of success. In New Zealand, we too do tend to add in a bit of clomiphene to get two eggs instead of one, but of course that then increases the risk of twin pregnancy. Intrauterine insemination is relatively easy though, and essentially a woman will ring us with her period, have daily blood tests starting from about the seventh or eighth day to pick up which day she's ovulating. And then we can pinpoint which day for the sperm to be brought in, prepared and then inseminated into the cervix. IVF is probably the treatment that gets the most uh, publicity. Uh, you'll be aware that it's been around since the late 1970s when baby Brown was born um, in the UK. And now about 2 to 3% of babies in New Zealand are born through IVF. It's got a lot simpler and a lot safer over the last 10 or 15 years. And ballpark figure, the pregnancy chances have doubled with IVF in the last 10 to 15 years, which is really exciting. That's largely to do with changes that have happened in the laboratory with our ability to look after embryos better. But the exciting thing also about IVF is that it's got simpler, particularly from a woman's point of view in terms of fewer injections. We most commonly do what are called short antagonist cycles. And the beauty of those is that they also significantly reduce the risk of something called hyperstimulation syndrome. That's where the ovaries over respond to the injections and get quite big. And you can occasionally end up with quite severe bloating and occasionally be admitted to hospital. I'm pleased to report that that's now quite a rare complication um, with IVF. And we have a wonderful blood test called an AMH, anti-malarian hormone, that we can do on a woman to assess her ovarian reserve. And we can quite accurately predict what her risk is of hyperstimulation and modify the drugs accordingly. And it also allows us to predict if someone might be a poor responder because of a low AMH, in which case we can counsel about increasing the dose of drugs and also manage expectations about the IVF outcome. We're pretty good in Australia and New Zealand at putting a single embryo back with IVF, uh, and the twin rate in IVF in, Austra in, in Australia and New Zealand's down to about 4 to 5%, which is fantastic compared to England and America, where they're still putting two embryos back a lot of the time. You may be aware of the treatment called ICSI, or microinjection. This was introduced worldwide in the mid-1990s and really transformed um, the treatment options for men with low sperm counts. 
it wasn't widely appreciated that you actually had to have pretty normal sperm to do ordinary IVF. And so introducing microinjection or ICSI, which is putting a single sperm into an egg, really meant that we could treat most men with sperm issues. And it's made a massive difference. We would do ICSI probably in about half of the cycles that we do. Um, and um, it's a very straightforward procedure commonly done now. In terms of treatment success, it's very dependent on the age of the woman and much less dependent on the age of the man. The government funding access cuts off at age 40 and that rule was set in place many years ago, not because IVF can't still work when you're 40 or 41, but because the success rates are reasonably reduced. The good news is that it's been increased from many years ago when the age cut off was 35 or 36. And so by increasing it up to 40, it has increased the options for couples. There is, however, a 12 to 18 month wait for treatment around a lot of the country, even if you do get enough points to access treatment. And so you can see that that is a significant issue if you're already 38 or 39 and having to look at waiting a further 12 to 18 months. And so certainly there's been some lobbying of politicians over the last few years to try and increase the funding for fertility nationally. IVF has, as I said before, certainly got more successful. And we would say now to a woman who's under the age of 35 or 36 with an AMH in the normal range, that she has something like a 50% chance um, of getting pregnant from an IVF cycle, including frozen embryos, and I'm pleased to report that the chance of getting pregnant from a frozen embryo is now is as good as getting um, pregnant from a fresh embryo. If you jump up to age 40, the chances of getting pregnant roughly half, but you can see that it still is reasonably successful in women of that age, recognising that they will have an increased risk of a miscarriage just purely because of their age. I'm pleased to report also that Big studies overseas have shown that there's no increased risk of cancer from having fertility treatment, and it also doesn't speed up the rate at which you lose your eggs. We do find it difficult to improve egg quality, particularly if it's um, related to age. There are some treatments available, including treatment with antioxidants such as CoQ10 or melatonin, but the evidence for benefit is fairly weak. Obviously, egg donation remains an option for women who have got very poor ovarian reserve, but at the moment in New Zealand, sperm and egg donors can't be compensated um, or reimbursed. Um, donation has to be altruistic. But again, there is a proposal that's come from the Ministry of Health um, to allow donors in New Zealand to be recompensated, a little bit like the UK did a couple of years ago. Uh, but the Minister of Health um, is still making a decision on that. Um, there hasn't been an announcement about it. When should a couple seek help? Well, essentially, I would say seek help when you're worried, but certainly after 12 months. Um, if you're under the age of 35, and six to nine months if you're um, over that age. At the end of the day, it's very reasonable for, um, for doctors um, to offer help when a couple are worried. Uh, and that, that will vary um, from couple to couple. Um, know about your fertile time. Um, it's quite easy to detect ovulation now using either um, self-education about um, mucus change and temperature, LH urine testing kits, or getting a blood test to confirm exactly when you're ovulating. There's a lot of information out there about lifestyle adjustments that can be made, and there's been a lot of interest um, recently in the effects of particularly male obesity on sperm quality. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. There's a question here um, 
does long-term oral contraceptive pill affect female fertility and how long should it take for ovulation to restart? The answer is long-term contraception um, use does not affect female fertility but it's also important to remember that it doesn't protect it and so I often see women who feel that because they've been on a pill that's been stopping them from ovulating it might have protected or conserved their egg numbers in some way and unfortunately that's not the case so you lose eggs continuously each month every day and it won't be changed by being on the pill or not. I would normally expect, unless there's an underlying ovulation disorder such as polycystic ovary, for ovulation to restart within three to six months of stopping the pill. And if it hasn't done it in that, in that instance, um, then I would seek help. There's a question saying that you're about to start um, a second IVF cycle. <coughs> First cycle responded quite well because of, well, it's low at AMH. Fast forward 10 months and I now have very low ovarian reserve and concerned I won't respond well. Do you see women with very low AMH still able to produce a number of eggs? <coughs> and if not, when would you cancel a cycle? That's a very good question. Um, AMH has been around for five or six years commonly in New Zealand and it's at the moment the best blood test that we've got for measuring ovarian reserve. But having said that, having treatment and taking stimulation drugs is also a true test of ovarian reserve. If a woman's AMH is less than four or five picomoles per litre, then we will predict that she's likely on average to get less than five or six eggs. Whereas if the AMH is higher, we're likely to get a higher number. And I think there is reasonable evidence now that if your AMH is significantly low, less than four or five, then it will have some impact on your overall chances of, of getting pregnant and having a live birth from treatment. Having said that, we have absolutely had women get pregnant and have babies with an undetectable AMH. And so we would certainly not tell people to give up hope. In terms of when would we cancel a cycle, we would generally carry on if someone's on a maximum um, dose of drugs and there's only two or three follicles. If there's only one follicle, it can be difficult, although we probably do have a 70 to 80% chance of getting an egg from that one single follicle. The next question says, um, pollutants can affect fertility, um, what does that mean? There's a lot of um, interest in what environmental pollutants um, might have in terms of fertility. It's probably more related to the effect on the embryo and utero. And so there's a suggestion that the decline in male reproductive health that's been seen over the last 50 years with a halving in the total sperm counts in the Western world could well be related to est increased estrogens in the environment affecting the male fetus and utero. Whenever we see a couple with subfertility and particularly where there's a male um, sperm factor, we will ask what sort of work the man does to see if he's being exposed to certain um, industrial chemicals or paints. Um, but again, some of the evidence for whether uh, removing yourself from that pollutant makes a difference is unclear. There's a further question saying that that her, her doctor has referred her to fertility associates suffering from polycystic ovary. Just wondering what the funding criteria is. Access to treatment in New Zealand for fertility um, is governed by what's called CPAC scoring. And if there is something seriously wrong, such as blocked tubes or uh, a significant sperm problem, a couple will have enough points after 12 months only of trying. So long as the woman's under the age of 40 and has a BMI of less than 32 and is a non-smoker. It's a little bit more complicated if the problem is an ovulation disorder. And essentially, unless the woman's having no periods at all, 
and has not responded to um, simple medication, then you will need to try medications such as clomiphene or letrozole um, and either not respond to that or do it for six to nine months and not get pregnant before you'll have enough points. And at the moment, in most of the clinics and hospitals, there's no government funding for the clomiphene or letrozole. So there will be some costs of a few hundred dollars for monitoring the response on those cycles. So many, many women with polycystic ovary won't be eligible immediately for public funding, but, but may well become so. And usually the treatment, if they um, become ex, uh, eligible for tertiary treatment, is IVF, um, rather than simpler ovulation induction with injections. Is it easy to get pregnant if you have fibroids? The answer to that is usually yes. Uh, Fibroids, depending on their position, can affect fertility. So the most extreme would be where the fibroids actually in the cavity of the uterus. They're called submucosal fibroids. And that certainly can impact on infertility or cause an increased risk of miscarriage. They're usually easy to remove by doing what's called a hysteroscopy, which is a camera in through the cervix. And the fibroid can be gently cut away without damaging the uterus. If a fibroid's quite big, five or six centimetres or more, and it's in the wall of the uterus, even if it's not actually pushing and distorting the lining, there's some evidence that a fibroid of that size can, can interfere with intility. And again, we would generally remove that they, the, the recommend that they be removed. Removing fibroids is generally a solution, and it's pretty unusual for it to harm the uterus so that in the future um, there will be a problem. The next question is um, talking about letrozole versus clomiphene, and are there any negative effects of taking letrozole? Um, letrozole has been our drug of choice for the last two years because a really big American study showed that it has a better chance of creating pregnancy than clomiphene and a much lower chance of twin pregnancy, hugely. So you don't need to do as much monitoring with letrozole. The other nice thing about it is the half-life is so much shorter so that it only stays in your body for a few days as opposed to a couple of weeks with clomiphene. It's worth noting that it is banned for ovulation induction in India. And that's because the Indian um, Ministry of Health um, looked at it a few years ago and decided, based on looking at the literature, they did have a few concerns about its safety. Suffice to say that America um, FDA has approved it as um, being used for ovulation induction, as has most of the Western world. And it's certainly my drug of choice in preference to clomiphene. The next question is, is it worth getting fertility tests for a couple that are not yet trying for a baby? I'm 32 and my husband's 35. I think the answer to that is, is that it is, if having children is really important to you. Um, and what I would simply recommend is an AMA for the woman um, to check that she's not one of the 10 to 20 percent of women at age 32 to 33 that have in fact got quite a low ovarian reserve. Because if you have that information, it might mean that you change your plans and take, um, um, uh, take some attempts to get pregnant earlier. And I think it would be sensible also for the husband to do a semen analysis, again, to identify if there's any obvious problem. The next question says, I have in the past early onset macular degeneration. I was 28, resulting from blood clot in my eye. As a result, my eye doctors have insisted I do not take any medication that might thicken my blood, or I risk going blind. Are there any fertility treatments which would be unavailable to me? Um, the answer to that question is that there are none that I'm aware of that would be unavailable to you. But clearly, given the severity of the potential complication, um, if you were going to have treatment, we would simply check with your eye specialist that they were happy with that. Next question says, I've been charting for over a year. My luteal phase is only 12 days. Could this be affecting my fertility? The answer is very unlikely that a luteal phase probably has to be less than 9 or 10 days for it to be potentially an issue. And if you've got 12 days with no bleeding, that's very likely to be fine. 
it would if you've got any concerns doing a day 20 day 19 um progesterone just to check that the levels are satisfied the next question how long do couples with unexplained infertility have to wait in order to access public fertility services that's a really good question the problem is that it's five years and there's no allowance made for the age of the woman so if you're 37 or 8 years old and you've been trying for three years you have to wait for five years if you've got unexplained to get enough points and you're likely to turn 40 before you get enough points the other dilemma as i said is that for most parts of new zealand there's a 12 to 18 month wait for publicly funded treatment Unexplained infertility isn't always unexplained. There's quite often an undiagnosed sperm issue and sometimes an undiagnosed ovarian reserve issue. Again, unfortunately, you don't get extra points under the current system if you've got low ovarian reserve. I'm trying to follow FAM and using OverQ to monitor my cycle and ovulation. The naturopath recommended Vitex and saw Palmetto. Do you think I should be concerned? Um, I'm not familiar with saw Palmetto. Um, again, if you're wanting to be certain about ovulation, I think the most accurate way is a urine or uh, blood LH test which would be started daily, probably from about day eight, if you have a 28 day cycle. And I would also get a blood progesterone level done in the middle of the teal phase um, to confirm that you have ovulated. To get pregnant, you need a peak progesterone of over about 25 um, units. Next question is, is there a difference for acceptable BMI between public and private? I've heard 25, 30 and 32. Again, this is a really good, um, relevant question. The cutoff for BMI in the public system is 32. And this was set many, many years ago because there was some evidence, and it was reasonably strong evidence, that the risk of miscarriage and the chance of getting pregnant <clears throat> were affected um, if the BMI was over 32. Having said that, um, the reduction in pregnancy chance for some women may not be very significant. And if age is a problem, they're between a rock and a hard place about losing weight versus the impact of increasing age. Most New Zealand fertility doctors are not happy to treat someone with particularly IVF or intrauterine insemination if their BMI is over 40. And the reason for that is the increased risks associated with pregnancy, um, particularly diabetes, increased surgical risk if you need a caesarean section. I went to an interesting seminar in America two years ago um, where the topic of the seminar was where was the cutoff for obesity for doing IVF? And remember, this was in the United States of America. And there was an ethicist and a obstetric physician and an IVF specialist among the people on the panel. <clears throat> and long story short, I was quite surprised that the cutoff that they felt was a BMI of 50, um, which is a significantly higher than the cutoff that we would be comfortable with in New Zealand. Unfortunately, there's very little leeway in the um, in the access to public funding with a BMI of 32. The next question is, what do they do if the male has anti-sperm antibodies? So when a semen analysis test is done in a fertility clinic, um, we do what's called a MAR test, which is looking for something called anti-sperm antibodies. We don't always know why a man has anti-sperm antibodies in the semen, but they are often a reaction to trauma or previous infection. And antibodies can cause the sperm to not move properly, to stick together, and to impact fertilization. The best way of dealing with anti-sperm antibodies is either intrauterine insemination, because the washing process will largely get rid of the anti-sperm antibodies, 
And so long as the motility and the count are okay, intrauterine insemination should be fine. The alternative, of course, is IVF with microinjection, and that will also overcome any anti-sperm antibody issue. 20 years ago, we used to try giving the man steroids um, as an anti-immune, um, and that was reasonably unsuccessful, unfortunately. Next question, can the AMH test be ordered by a GP or as a specialist only? AMH can certainly be ordered by a general practitioner. Um, there's no government funding for the AMH. It's approximately $60. And the reason why there's no public funding is because it's four or five years old, um, but the government hasn't yet approved it as a free test. There are links, certainly on the Auckland lab test results, to the websites of fertility clinics that have got maps um, and graphs explaining the result. One of the issues, I guess, for women is that quite often their general practitioner may not be able to fully explain the implication of the AMH for them. And we're always happy for couples to contact us email or phone if they would like to chat about the AMH result. Why is it that generally you have to have had three miscarriages before testing is undertaken to check out whether there is a medical reason for your loss? <clears throat> this does seem harsh um, for many couples and many women um, because even having one miscarriage can be devastating. The reason why particularly the public funded clinics have a cut off of three miscarriages or three early pregnancy losses is because it's quite unusual to get a positive result from the quite expensive testing at times if a couple have only had one or two miscarriages. <clears throat> Certainly if you see um, a specialist or a doctor in private, that testing can be done earlier if it's indicated. And we'll discuss with you that it's perhaps sensible to do some of the simpler um, autoimmune testing and perhaps not do carrier typing, which is checking the chromosomes of the man or the woman until three miscarriages have occurred. I'd point out that the risk of picking up a chromosome problem, for instance, um, or the chance of picking that up is probably less than 1%. Um, and the tests cost the government about $500 each. So that's $1,000 for a couple. My motility count was significantly low, but the count was double normal. Does this mean the number of healthy sperm is still good? The answer to that question is quite difficult. And we know that it's really important to look at all of the parameters on a sperm test um, to determine um, uh, how it's going to function. So in addition to motility and count, we look at shape, which is morphology. And we're increasingly getting to understand that, that morphology is really important as well. I would make the observation that although sperm counts at your community laboratory are good for assessing the volume and the, and the number, you really need to do a sperm test in a fertility clinic um, to get an accurate assessment of motility um, and morphology and anti antibodies if that's indicated. We know that a healthy man can have a sperm count that's quite variable. And I would usually like several weeks apart before making any final decisions. My cycles range between 29 and 34 days. Is this counted as irregular? Um, I don't think that would be counted as irregular, given that it's a four to five day um, pattern. But any more than that, and I probably would. Again, I would be interested to know whether that person has detectable signs of ovulation and whether they've done a progesterone in the second half of the cycle to confirm that they are in fact ovulating. There's some really good questions there and as you can see, um, each of them covers a, a different area that's pretty relevant.
There's a further question prior to commencing IVF, what are the things that a couple can do to help their chances of success? Probably the most important are optimising any um, modifiable lifestyle things. So weight we think is important both for men and women. And there's increasing evidence from some Australian studies that if a man's BMI is over 35, that can significantly in some cases impact on the chances of IVF working. Certainly important for a woman to identify to modify her weight, and we would certainly advise couples to not smoke. I think that's the end of the questions by the look of it. Thanks, Nicola. So there were some excellent questions. Thank you very much, Guy Goodex, for um, for the presentation tonight. I think that was really helpful for everybody who attended. Um, tomorrow night we will have um, age and fertility here at 8pm at so we hope to see you for that and thank you again uh, Doctor for the presentation tonight. Pleasure, pleasure, good night. Good night.